This episode of Why We Bleep is sponsored by Signal Sounds. Hey you, Hannah Peel fan! Are you interested in experimenting with synthesizers? In the strong eventuality that this episode of Why We Bleep gets you hot under the collar for messing with synths, may I direct your attention to signalsounds.com. Yes, they are a retailer of great repute and stock the most interesting of things, including the Rolanda Harkorgatron 67, the brand new Binkleflex 94, the Music Easel Command, the Merg Vacadeur, Descartes Dream, and the new Profet 5 and 10, some of which are real instruments. So if you like really nice people who really stock really real music equipment, navigate your clicks via the telemedium of a mouse to signalsounds.com. That website again, it's signalsounds.com. Hey, you Hannah Peel fan. Welcome to Why We Bleep. And today I'm extremely proud to say we've got Hannah Peel on the show. Yes. Northern Irish Emmy nominated BBC Radio 3 Night Tracks presenting composer, violinist and synth fiend and all round top human being. Hannah Peel. Yes, don't worry about it. She was born in Craigavon, west southwest of Belfast, but moved to Barnsley, which is extremely east southeast of Craigavon, at the age of eight. And according to Yorkshire Live, Barnsley features the broadest of Yorkshire accents. And it's interesting to hear how Hannah's voice is obviously, she's got that deeply northern Yorkshire twang. It is one of my favourite accents, that. And Hannah, in true northern fashion, has played with colliery barras bands as part of her Mary Cassio project, which is a wonderful uh, music project. But what we talked about today was a more recent one, which is to say that Hannah has got a new record out. It is, in fact, Sunday today, no matter when you listen to this. And a couple of days ago, no matter when you listen to this, was Friday. And on that Friday, she released Fur Wave. Uh, not to do with furry things, but to do with trees. Fur Wave, which is a thing, a phenomenon that we talk about. And this record itself is a phenomenon. It is a remaking, a reimagining of the 1972 KPM 1000 series record Electrosonic. This is a library record which was produced by just some person called Delia Derbyshire and also Brian Hodgson and Don Harper. And it was produced as a, a library record. It would be music that you were royalty-free, able to slap on other things. Does that mean if I bought a copy, I could, like, slap it over this? I've missed a trick there, if that's the case. And it, in fairness, as we talk about in the podcast, Electrosonic is an extremely challenging record. I'm not sure what ever got scored to it or it went underneath because I, find, I think it would be distracting. I think it would be extremely hard to concentrate on whatever was happening on the screen because of the wild music that was occurring in the back. It is an extremely experimental record, which is amazing. And so in this conversation, we talk about that and the way that Hannah reimagined this into a new record. And her record is wonderful. It's a sort of, I think the best way of describing it is it's like an experience, man. It's like a sort of... It just it evokes a kind of atmosphere, a place, a very organic, uh, non-industrial place, which is interesting. It's something we talk about. And so, yes, the sampling of this is a topic we discuss. The disintegration of tape loops working live with John Fox in Benj's studio. And I don't know if you've heard of Benj, but he is an interesting character who has just the world's most outrageous synthesizer collection. And I, I wanted to ask Hannah about exploring that because John Fox, Benj and her have worked together and she does. We talk about playing church organs and artificial intelligence rears its head. But the conversation begins in medias res. As they say, we are 
I begin it mid-conversation as we were talking about Bertie Moog, which is the name of Hannah's Whippet. Yes, true to her sort of northern Yorkshire childhood, Hannah does indeed own a Whippet, although it is an old Irish Whippet, so um, it's not a Yorkshire Whippet, of course. I'm sure it speaks with a different accent. So this was a wonderful meandering synth chat, which begins with a conversation of Bertie Moog. But before we talk to Hannah Peel, we have just one more short sponsored message. Why We Bleep is also sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people like you. Offering thousands of inspiring video-based classes on a very multitudinous array of topics, from illustration to graphic design, from music production to animation, writing, film and video and productivity, that list it is long. But the classes are short. With classes under 60 minutes, there are lessons to fit any schedule. I make YouTube videos now and then and was intrigued to watch YouTube success, script shoot and edit with MKBHD, an incredibly well-structured and lucidly delivered whistle-stop tour on how Marcus Brownlee makes his YouTube videos. And he's got 13 million subscribers. So I think I can tell you that he speaks from experience. He covers research and planning, lighting, editing, and all round juicy details on how you make a successful YouTube channel, which is something that I think I could do with learning a little bit about. And which is just as well, because Skillshare is highly affordable at less than $10 a month with a yearly subscription. But I have a deal. The first 1,000 people who click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Skillshare. Learn new skills. And with that, I do believe it is time. Let us metaphorically knock three times on Delia's lampshade and meet Hannah Peel. Thanks. under the desk and then I can take out for walks when I need to walk and it gets me out of my studio so I'm not sat the whole day and and then when I looked at whippets and you know they, they don't bark that often apparently and luckily he doesn't and he just sleeps all the time and loves his little walk and then he just sleeps and he just he's constantly next to me it's so nice oh, that is, <laughs> so. especially in lockdown but wait a minute when he goes for a walk is he not just like just yeah go. totally very, very fast. <laughs> That's, yeah, the whole walking the dog and getting out, there was, um, I've mentioned this before, there was like an interview that I keep sort of thinking about where it was a gold panda talking about mm-hmm. um, where he wrote um, one of his early albums and he was basically like, the dog walking was integral because when I was making the music, I would then have to leave the studio and go for a, a walk with the dog. And it's that break that um, kept me fresh and interested. Yeah, that's good. I think... I would totally agree with that. Absolutely. Like, you know, sometimes you think I'm not getting enough work done because of X, Y and Z, but then I come in and I nail it really quickly. So uh, I would say dogs are the way forward. But, uh, you know, I have my parents and family have a Cocker Spaniel. In fact, they've got loads of Cocker Spaniels. But whenever I look after this particular one for them, I never get a thing done because they just demand your attention all the time and their energy levels are, are constant. And so, um, but yeah, studio dogs, the ones, the quiet ones and whippets, totally the way to go. Absolutely. I'm getting a whippet. <laughs> it's a done deal. Yeah. And they look so elegant and lovely. They do. Yeah, they are. Is it sort of grey and kind of, or is it? Oh yeah. Some people do, but he is, I've called him, you'll like this, I've called him Bertie Moog. Oh my goodness. And <laughs> I did want to call him Bobby, Bobby Moog, but then I was like, I, I quite liked Bertie and it does suit him, but he's a red brindle. So he's kind of striped like a tiger and he's got white paws and a white tip on his tail. Oh, that's nice. Easy to spot when he's like legged it into a <laughs> <Yeah>. far field. <laughs> yeah, very much. <laughs> so um, I suppose the f- place to begin is this album, um, Fur Wave, uh, which... When I f- first sort of read the title, I was like, I was kind of, I thought about it. I was like, Square Wave, 
sine wave, <laughs> fur wave. I don't know that one. Um, and then sort of read a little bit about the the concept. And I suppose like the question to you is kind of is really to get into that, like the what was the inception and what is the process of or what was the process of making it like for you? Yeah. Um Firstly, can I say I really like your podcast series. Oh, thank you. Uh, a lot of the people you've interviewed are people that I follow online and, and really like, um, or know even as well. Yeah, so, amazing. Um, thank you. But yes, fur wave, fur wave is a pattern of trees, a pattern of fir trees that can be found in only in certain places around the world on mountainsides. And it's where the wind hits the front of the fir trees and gradually that causes them to die down but it allows the trees behind to grow so you constantly get this wave formation that's formed over time like a long period of time and if you look at the certain mountainsides there's one in Canada and one in Japan that they look like wave formations and I thought this was a beautiful way to kind of sum up the record, that connection with nature, the patterns in nature and how that relates to music in general, but electronic music specifically for this record and the energy and the the kind of notion that there is no difference between a violinist and, a, and an electronic artist. We were all of the same thing. We were all shaping sound in a different way. So I do hope a lot of people look up the word fur wave <laughs> and, and don't mistake it for being like furry rather than fur trees but yes the the album and the conception of it started with EMI production own um uh, all the rights to the KPM library series uh records I mean there's hundreds thousands of them but one in particular is the KPM uh, 1000, which is Electrosonic, and that is Delia Derbyshire, Brian Hodgson and Don Harper. And it's just a library record that they did in 1972, went under several different names, um, maybe to not conflict with other work that they had on or maybe with the BBC. Um, and it is a series of tracks that explores, I guess, more of it has certain elements of nature to them, but it's more about industrial and kind of scientific lab type mm. sounds. So you can imagine them being used in documentaries and things on TV. Um, it, when I listened to it, I did wonder, like, who used this? Like, and where <laughs> was it used? It's very <laughs> experimental, isn't it? It is. I was like, this would... Do you know what I mean? It's that thing of should should music bury itself into the background or not, like... <laughs> I actually made I made some music for for this YouTube audio library, and I did think about that. I was like, should I make this to be transparent and fade away, like sort of you know, music for airports, or should it be in front? And it's it is so bonkers, isn't it? And <laughs> yeah. I mean, what did you, when did you first encounter it? What's your sort of what's um, your take on the music? I mean, I had not heard it before the, this moment in time where EMI came to me and said, "Would you like to take this record?" and and do what you want with it, make a new version uh, of it. Um, yeah. So, you know, I guess I could have had the option of not touching it at all, but being influenced by certain ideas, maybe. Uh, but yeah, it is completely bonkers. And I, I have no idea how it was used. But for them, I guess, you know, it was all about experimentation. It was sound development. I mean, you can almost hear them cutting the tape and using the oscillators at that period in time. And, and I just think that it's got a wonderful boldness to it and yeah I mean how do you if somebody offers you that how do you go about creating a new record what um, brief as well to be like <laughs> yeah. take this uh, total brief but also just like the pressure I mean you know they're quite they're quite iconic the people that made this so I, I didn't want to just kind of rip it apart <laughs> but I, essentially I did so you know, instead of, I guess, instead of treating it like a remix project where you're taking tracks and then obviously using melodies and certain beats, I sampled the actual sounds that are in the record. So I just did clips of things that I felt were quite clear and um, maybe not so obscure, but had a new neutrality to them that meant that, that I could easily transform them into 
uh, in contact in native instruments and make them into a, a MIDI instrument. And so then I can just play those sounds myself and make a whole record without looking back, but using those wonderful sound textures and layers that were created. So, um, and so that's, yeah, so that's the inception of it and that started it off and it wasn't, um, it was definitely, you know, it was, it was main intention was as library music. It wasn't for release at all. <laughs> um, so it's amazing that now, yeah, I guess I got the, the courage to release it and, you know, had to tweak quite a few things to make it into a record and an album that sounds good for radio and, and things. But interestingly, I guess with library music, you're not writing for an audience and there's definitely a sense of exploration that I probably wouldn't have gone with if I'd done my own solo record. Mm. Well, I was listening to it. There's the the second track, which I really wish I could remember the exact name of, uh, <laughs> Emergence in Nature, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, is such a, it reminds me, it's like sort of, it's like a, a dance record and you feel like, oh, this could build into this, but it's not afraid to sort of, meanders like the wrong word that makes it sound bad but it's not it's it's just that it it's um it's that sense of looking at a landscape you know it's like it's it has sort of nooks and crannies and different places it goes and it's not it's interesting I don't know if you can sort of speak to that idea of it being like a sort of atmosphere that and its own I don't know how you strike that balance basically yeah yeah no you, you've totally summed it up right I have been dying to make more of a dance kind of record for quite a while. But I guess the kind of projects that I take on in terms of, you know, film and TV or commissions with certain bands like colliery bands or orchestras, it means that sometimes I don't get the chance because I'm already busy doing something else. And so I guess I was never going to make a full dance record. It was always going to have atmospheres and layers and textural things and I guess when you look at the kind of the angle that I went at in some ways you know the the original record was very industrial aware very scientifically aware there was also kind of I guess around that time as well a kind of Soviet style and things that was starting to creep into a lot of people and mm. and the social context whereas right now it's it's about the eco it's about recycling it's it it almost felt like, you know, a record like this would have to encompass different areas and different sound worlds in order to kind of speak of everything fully, if that makes sense, because it's instrumental and I can't, I didn't want to put vocals on it or anything. So, well, there are those sort of the beautiful like and wind shadow. There's vocals, isn't there? Sort of like choral, yeah. a lovely choral element. Is, is that right? Have I got that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. love that. Is that and is that you or is that from the record? Was that from Electrosonic or was it? No, it's me. <laughs> so what I did with my vocals, I treated it in the same way as I did with the instruments. So it's a it's a sample of my voice that I've then played, um, and then underneath that is the kind of whirring, growling sound that kind of builds and explodes, and that is um, a lyra. Uh, like one of oh, those yeah. noise machines that yes. I'd, I'd got and I didn't know how to use. But of course, when you don't know how to use something, that's the best thing, isn't it? Because then you just end up totally exploring it without any preconceptions. So yeah. um, I don't even know if I could get those sounds again. <laughs> but but yeah, it, that that was from that. So it just, yeah, I, it's funny, isn't it? Like it, the original record didn't have vocals on, but then I was like, well, I've heard, you know, interviews with Delia where she talks about going home and playing the spinet and getting completely lost in the sound of it. And that's a side of her that we don't talk about quite a lot. And I guess the vocal side of me is something I don't talk about a lot. Yeah. the uh, I remember I went to a, there was a talk by the Radiophonic Workshop and there was, they talked about blue veils and golden sands and how that sort of like, nee, 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 sort of <laughs> weird like sound, that is her voice. And it is apparently her voice like, I don't know, through probably a whole bank of filters and whatever processes, but apparently so, and then chopped up. Oh, amazing. Just as, just as you're doing the contact, really. Oh, yeah. hey. Well, there's a bit of serendipity I didn't know. <laughs> exactly. So, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alex, I meant to do that all along. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. No, no, I know. It's a direct reference to Delia's uh, <laughs> techniques, of course. 
So that, but I suppose then if you're like, because if you're listening to the record, how do you decide which bits that you want to say, well, I'm going to use that, I'm having that? Or how do you, what do you pick? What do you leave out? Yeah, I mean, a little bit of um, experimentation, but I guess it has to be a sound that will work across a lot of different keys and things. So in terms of tonality, so, you know, I guess that it has to have something that is a, a, a neutral kind of element to it that allows for me to manipulate it and an, and also to be long enough for me to sample it and create it into mm. a new instrument. So, you know, the short stuff I did take and I used and it, it's fine, but also when you want to create that kind of ambient a sense as well and the more flowing things, you do need longer things. So I was just on the lookout for that side of things more I guess because that's what I wanted more I mean the beats and everything they don't come from that record they come from uh I've got a little uh it's, uh, it's a mini pop it was KO mini pop um like one of those little drum machines that would have been attached to an organ at the time um, is it the oh the mini, KO mini pops yeah like the Oh, that would be like the Inception Korg, i.e. like yeah. Korg before it was Korg. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, so I've got one of them just lying around and, yeah, so that makes up quite a lot of the beats that are on there. Um, and the original, so what happened was I made this record like two years ago and then when kind of, you know, lockdown started in 2020, it felt like there was a quite a lot of like, you know, my manager and email saying, look, if you ever want to release this as a record, we'd, we'd fully support it. We think it sh you should. And I kind of was like, no, no, no one's ever hearing this. I don't want to. Um, so when I went to back to look at it and revisit it, I sent it to a friend of mine called Tim Allen. Mm. He's an incredible mixer and um, is the partner of Hazel Mills, who's also yes. one of your um, podcasters. Yeah. And... Uh, he re-looked at some of the beats for me because I just wanted a perspective that wasn't mine because I was so stuck on it. And uh, Emergence in Nature was born with his production, co-production on that and yeah. um, eco-vocative. And then he just makes the whole record again just with that kind of essence of like more power and more drive rather than it just coming uh yeah, giving it a bit more of a kind of radio-friendly <laughs> essence than what yeah, it was before. How did he do? Did he change anything, or is it literally just in the art of how forward you make certain elements? What can you say? What he did, you know, how did it change? Um, yeah, I guess the perspective of having somebody else's ears. So he just, you know, he made it more punchier. He gave it more bass. He created. The sparkling, the kind of synths that I'd had that I'd made that were higher in frequency, he made them more sparkle and shimmer. And um, I think he used a kind of like, uh, I don't know what the plugin is called, but it's called a Saturn EQ. I can't remember the company that make it. Um, amazing EQ kind of thing that adds distortion and things like that and added yeah. a little bit more welly to it. So, I mean, like Emergence in Nature, when I listen back to it, I'm like, oh, my God, it's so different. Um you know his elements that he added in the in the beats and things he's just brought it all together as one whole kind of thing and it you know mm. it's like what you say you think you're going to get a dance record he's he's the one that's kind of taken that to that place because i was so blinded by the fir trees i, did, <laughs> I couldn't think any further <laughs> so it's interesting you know it's interesting it's um I'm always in awe of people who can sort of hear something and then hear how it's supposed to be, you know, mm. or like another imagination of it. It just takes such a literally a leap of imagination and skill to kind of rework, which is what you were doing with the original, you know, the KPM record. It was just, there's just another type of transfer, that's all. Um, yeah, but, and it, isn't it nice as well that it goes from one kind of element to another and then you pass it on to somebody else and... It's yeah, it's it's a lovely way to collaborate actually with somebody without even being in a room. Yeah. And having that bravery. I think, you know, my kind of instructions to Tim was just do what you think is best because I am totally I've t I'm tired of it. I can't <laughs> think anymore on it. Yeah, yeah. It's um bat on, bat on past like yeah, yeah, no I get that. <laughs> what was that? Uh, the David Byrne record that where well, it wasn't David Byrne. Ah, what's the band? There's that sort of dance tune with David Byrne on it. 
And apparently mm. that was one of those where it was just like sent it to him and he just returned it complete, you know. Sort of. <laughs> nice when those things work, I'm sure. I don't know if there's yeah. plenty of stories of people sending them off to get stuff done where they're just like, okay, that goes in the bin after you, but it comes yeah. back. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Tim's obviously, um, yeah, he's done just great work. So it's And it's such a, it is very well mixed and, that's why it's sort of, although it's not a dance record, I should say it's not, I wasn't disappointed. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wasn't like, oh no, it's a, da- it's not a dance record. It's, it is a really engaging, interesting album. There's always a good hook, basically. There's a nice sort of like oh, melodic hook, I mean, you know, throughout it, which is for me just kind of pulls me through. But it is very textural as well. And there's something I've talked to a few artists like on this podcast about sort of texture versus melody and it, it definitely feels like you've struck a balance. That must be oh, your MO. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, that's good to hear because I do have this kind of thing in my head all the time. I guess coming from a child learning classical piano and and brass and violin, there is always this thing inside me that wants to to blend this kind of these worlds so that they don't feel like two. It just feels like one whole entity. And and to get that balance right is is really important. And I guess even though it's an electronic record, I have tried to make it sound as organic as possible, yeah. like that it's not forced. So it's really nice you say that. Thank you. Also, I wanted to point out that Tim is a massive Delia Derbyshire fan. So as soon as I told him about this, he was really excited. And his um his like Twitter handle is like the Delian mode. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, of course. And this record. I, st- I really wanted to call the Pelian mode. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I didn't dare do it, so. <laughs> yeah, it's a little on the nose, isn't it? Just <laughs> let people read the liner notes, yeah. draw their own conclusions. And so when you're, like, processing these sounds as well, because obviously with contact, there's, like, there is just a bonkers level of stuff you can do. It's, it has been a while since I've messed with contact, but I always remember when I first played around with that, I put, like, my recording my parents' piano... And I played with the the live like time stretch thing, which I always mm. thought was for having just come from kind of hardware samplers at the time, I was like, this is witchcraft. Mm-hmm. I can just time stretch in real time. But were you not tempted to kind of, that was, you know, when you were talking about having shorter and longer sounds, were you not tempted just to pull back that little time stretch mode or whatever on contact and just make them long? What limits did you put on yourself with regard to reworking? Were you not allowed to re make them unrecognisable? No, I mean, I had, I mean, I'm definitely somebody who works within limits, I'll say that, in terms of restrictions. Um, But I didn't feel the urge to do that. It felt like it never needed anything affected. Like, you know, in terms of the sample instruments, I think a lot of production things on those instruments came afterwards, Um, you know, using kind of sound toys and crystallizer and, and things that that feel like you're stretching the fabric of time and um but yeah the actual purity of the instruments I guess was quite important in some respects and also a nod to the past and history so um so no I didn't actually play with that or feel tempted by it either. So could you talk a bit about the sort of the the, like the typical composition process do you have a typical process and i suppose that it might be just this record it might be to do with composing to picture but it's what do you do and what have you learned basically what are the hard lessons you've learned about composing yeah oh that's a good question (laughs) um they um i would say the main majority the thing that i've learned the most is not to be precious and things do not work out all the time and if you know there's a certain element that if it isn't working out that you might beat yourself up about it. And I've certainly done that in the past, but in the last few years I've become more accustomed to knowing what my skills are and not being afraid of them and walking away from something if it isn't working, but keeping it in your back pocket. Because sometimes you write a mail, like the other day I was working on something and I did this whole hour of recording this piano part and I was like right this is great I'm going to use this and then I listen back the next day which is always good for fresh ears Mm. and I don't like it at all it was absolutely (laughs) rubbish but I'm not going to dump it and I'm not going to be affected by that because actually 
there's so many things I've used in the past that have come from maybe two or three years ago and then they sound perfect for a pitch or they sound perfect for a, a show or something I'm working on or an album and you think oh yeah that's what that was for um yeah so I guess you know that was that is one of the kind of hard lessons that I've learned because you know you you can push yourself into a, a creative block and that's that's the worst thing and and you know one one of the things we were talking about having a dog is that you um it it, it stops you from doing that because you get out of your seat and you take a walk and you get a fresh breath of, of air and can think about things kind of more realistically rather than tied up in your brain mm. um also i really i mean I, I guess quite a few people that might be listening to this as well but i love the oblique strategy cards as so many times i've just you know i have them always on my desk in a, in the little box and if there's anything I'm just kind of thinking and getting a bit bored with or something, I just pick up one of those and it's always got an answer <laughs> to That's everything. It. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, let's try it. They always seem so oblique whenever I... That's <laughs> 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 the problem with them damn strategies. I'm not sure how to apply them, but I don't have a set. I'm going to buy a set now. Oh. So we'll go on, what's, what's your strategy okay, for today? Yeah. What, what have we got? <laughs> Voice nagging suspicions. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that's wow. the perfect answer to that question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, that is, you're very suspicious about it. But, um, you yeah, know, I, I think it, what it does is it takes you out of thinking of the out of the box. Even if you don't get the answer that you want, it stops you. It, it's a trick. And uh, sometimes I find that even moving from the computer to the piano or moving to a different instrument also takes you out of that box. Sometimes you don't want to because you're just, like I get very determined and like, I've got to do this, I've got to fix this. And then the best thing is just to get up and move somewhere else. And sometimes the, the, the problem or the creative problem is is solved. Um, yeah. So I guess, yeah, that's my, those are my techniques. <laughs> and the, the tech and everything else comes with that and learning what you like and what you don't like. With regard to tools, you mean, or just yeah. uh, techniques? Yeah, tools. And, you know, there was a time that I would have spent every single penny I had on every synth synthesizer that I could possibly find. Um, and I was really, really kind of diligent. I was like, no, I'm not using things in the computer. It's all analog. And, you know, that time I learned a lot of, I learned a lot of things, but now I find that I've kind of honed it down to just a, a few that I use all the time and some that I keep for nostalgia because they're really cool. And, you know, I've got a Jupiter 4 and I, I just hardly use it. It's just there. But I can't get rid of it because it's just so full of memories and, and beautiful sounds that I did create on it at one point. But, you know, it's like everything. You kind of move, don't you? And you change as your as your life changes. So... Yeah, honing the kind of skills and and that that's taken time and years, but I guess it's been a valuable lesson. Which of the studio tools would you take to your desert island? What is the sort of the the honed subset? Oh my god! Okay, um, all right. Well, yeah, laptop, my Universal Audio Apollo. Oh yeah, I'm speaking to you through one as well. Yeah, <laughs> um, obviously a mic. Because you can pick up anything and then you can manipulate it in the computer. And I mean, if it wasn't too sandy, I'd take, I've got an LA610 Universal Audio and oh yeah, it's just beautiful for everything. It just makes everything sound gorgeous. The 610 specifically in the, is it, the, oh, this, that's just the pre, isn't it? Yeah. The, or is it the one with the, the LA2A in it? No, it's just the pre. Just the pre. Mm. Yeah, it's nice. It's lovely. So... Maybe those. I think that would be the best option. That's the full Delium like system, isn't it? The sort of modern Delium, just just sample everything. Yeah, <laughs> everything shall be sampled. Yeah. Coconuts and <laughs> in your backpack. Yeah. <laughs> you can make everything you want out of it, out of nature. But say that there's <laughs> one plug socket. Well, two plug sockets. There's one for your laptop, but there's also one for some synthesizers. Oh yeah, can we have electricity on the island? Of course, of course. Okay. The sol solar power. <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> oh, great. I like that. Oh, it's it's funny because I've just um, 
I do a lot for night tracks on Radio 3 broadcasting mm. and um, just been playing this record by Joe McKee, who's a kind of Australian composer, um, played in some bands. And I think he's based in like a, in L.A. or something now, but he spent three and a half weeks on a cargo ship um, sampling the sounds of the ship the beast, as he calls it, the creaks, oh, wow. the metal, bowing, kind of the metal things that he could find. And he's made this whole record. And, you know, some of them you can really tell it is the ship. And then some of them it's just so beautiful, ambient, l lengthened sounds that are just, it's a really gorgeous record. And, you know, he's done it entirely from sampling. Um, so, the, yeah, oh, the that, limits that are is, endless. <laughs> that is wonderful. I love that. The um, I was also listening to I was listening to Night Tracks recently, but the um, the last I think it's what well, it's the last one that was on the iPlayer, where you were playing uh, La Nina Juno, Juno or Juno and Sam Bennett's Oscillendium Eight, which mm -hmm. I noted because both of those were kind of single synth compositions, which was interesting. That sort of that notion of actually very much like uh, Mr. Benj, um, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. um, the notion of doing like single synth. And I don't know if that was what drew you to those tracks or how you kind of come across them. I, mean, I don't know how you, how do you select the music for that show as well? Because that's... <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, firstly, I love making this show. I think it is. And the, and the fact that it's Radio 3 and they've allowed us to kind of explore different things so yeah if you if you if you've got a track that is made of one singular synthesizer it that to me is just like so cool because you can have a, a track made of a single violin why not the single synthesizer so there's always that balance of finding stuff um but i have a wonderful there is a wonderful team that create everything the producers are fantastic and they would be very much classical and contemporary classical led so i guess what i bring to it is the more electronic and unusual side of things so um but all with that feeling of keeping it late night so there isn't anything that will cut your ears <laughs> and and wake you up um you know if people fall asleep or if people work to it during the day then you know that's goal achieved i think um mm. but it keeping you interested rather than it being bland and kind of a wash of neoclassical, which is not what we want at all. So, yeah, I mean, Bandcamp, I find yeah. so much stuff. I mean, there's some amazing independent artists and independent labels. Um, the Joe McKee one, he's he's on Salmon Universe, which are a London-based label run by Richard Pike and I think his brother, they're Australian. And I the stuff that they put out is just gorgeous. It's it's lovely, but also there's um, quite a lot of compilation albums. So uh, I came across an artist called Luca Lomb Longobardi, um, who's an Italian artist, and he was just on a on a compilation that was put together by a, an Italian label that was to go towards kind of refugees coming across the Mediterranean mm. into Italy. And I, I just you know some of the tracks on it are just incredible. So. So it's a great way of diving into it. We even discovered this kind of mini subgenre called comfy synth. I'll say cool. that again. Com because comfy synth. Comfy or synth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Comfort synth or comfy synth, which is uh, artists making music that is, how can I describe it? It is basically like fairy tale music. So it is every part of escapism that you can possibly encompass in electronic music so like there's tracks that are about donuts or or like um, or you know the the pink of candy floss or that side and it's just music to make you feel good <laughs> sounds like sort of raymond scott it's that sort yeah. of that kind of vibe yes and i think this you know there's it's it's such a small genre. If you sit, go into Bandcamp and search Comfy Synth, it'll come up with the artists that make it. And there's also kind of Doom Synth, which <laughs> is kind of elongated from the kind of... It's kind of all generated from the kind of rock music, mm. which is fascinating in itself. So this is the, the Doom side of it. <laughs> We're talking like Sun or, like, you I'm know, talking that kind like, of vibe. like Ambient Metallica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Have you have you seen Sun the the band play? Yes. Like, oh, yeah. 
yeah, that I guess is must be it. Or, yeah, I wish I, I, I sort of a style of music I don't know a lot about, and and I only saw them once, but I never forgot it. Funnily enough, <laughs> <laughs> I tend not to. Oh, amazing! Yeah, it's it's. I, I think that's what I love about electronic music is that you're creating these magical worlds that it feels like you're touching a part of your subconscious that you can't do sometimes with just an acoustic piano for example um or just your voice and and that you know the manipulation of things and is part of that and that's what i refer to when i talk about electronic music it isn't just about the analog it is about the digital side as well but yeah that, that's what excites me the most some of the all of the best stuff is digital i've found especially playing with like modular synths all of the mm. most sort of gnarly twisted otherworldly scapes come from digital stuff yeah. yeah that's where that's where there's sort of i don't know what the word is a lot of it can be very it, like very textural and stuff thinking of like old samplers with you know very low bit rate waveforms and mm. Um, and then when you're smashing them and filtering them, it has this, it does sound like waves and except it's obviously digital. Well, it's obviously synthetic. I mean, like it's, yeah. yeah. But with that said, if you, I suppose if you record analog to tape, then you get all that kind of texture as well. But it's in a weird way, it's, I don't know, some digital stuff can sound more analog than analog, if that makes <laughs> yeah. sense. Some things are too precise. Is Some analog tools are, I found. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I I guess one of the things I do miss because at the moment I'm kind of up against a lot of deadlines and, you know, this when you work in TV and film, there's a lot of demands on you to make stuff quite quickly. And I do personally miss playing things and twiddling. Mm. <laughs> and, and, you know, I find it very, very, I have to really snap myself out of just automatically going into the digital world. Like um, I recently bought, and it's still not arrived because of bloody COVID or Brexit or whatever, but uh, Folk Tech, the Resonant yeah. Garden, um, which has the kind of the strings coming, the guitar strings that are coming out, coming out like, sprouts of grass that yeah. you can pick and, and bow and I just can't wait for it to be here just so that I have some kind of toy to play with that, <laughs> that gets you excited again and well gets me excited again so. yeah yeah the I can see it's like that idea of like making time to play as well is something mm. I'm not I'm not a you know professional composer but I I even you know I recognize that where I'm making videos or doing things and I'm just what I don't have is that time where I just fart around and just yeah. exper the time to experiment it almost feels like I've spoken to some musicians are literally like I have a time for experimenting it's like this wow. is my experiment which is very organized that is that's <laughs> very admirable that's too organized for me definitely <laughs> and I'm pretty organized but even that is pretty much <laughs> yeah that is, it sounds a bit too much like organised fun. Yeah, no, <laughs> you, can't, fun at this time. you can't make yourself do it. Oh. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Each so um, what about synths, though? Uh, we never quite established what synths you would have in your Desert Island studio. Um, beach. Yeah, well, I guess my favourite synth of all time is my Juno 60. Mm. Uh, she has to come with me wherever I go. And <laughs> I got, um, I've got a wasp that I love. Oh, wow. So I guess those two combined covers quite a lot. Um, yeah. What, I mean, is, can you speak to the wasp as well? I've played with like the filters, the Eurac filters, but I never played with a real wasp. Like, is it, is it just as gnarly as the little, the filters I played with are just as unpredictable? <laughs> yes. Yes. It's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the fact that when you touch it, it kind of creaks. <laughs> the oh, plastic wow. almost breaks, but... Yeah, I mean, it is gnarly as anything and, yeah, lives up to its its name, the wasp, doesn't it? So, um, but, yeah, it's actually quite good condition. It's, it's, a, it's a great piece of kit and, you know, it's one of those ones that makes so much noise and it's so light and fits in your bag. <laughs> Can come anywhere. But, yeah, it's limitations, I think, because sometimes it's, it's beauty. Mm. Mm. So that and the Juno 60, I think, would be... That's very admirable. Yeah. The two, definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's my choice. The Juno does... It, it's cropping up a lot. Like, uh, basically everyone 
will take the Juno 60, and myself included. Really? I, t- I have a Juno 60 right here, and it's that is the synth I would take with my me as well. And it's sort of just, I don't know, it, there's clearly something going on here where it's like there's there was something that they got right about a certain just enough elements to Mm. have fun with but not so much that you never know what to do with it if that makes sense or you always know i you know i don't feel how you use it but speaking personally like i've although i have a 60 i use it like a six i don't use the presets because i've I've never performed Mm. with it live but i don't need to you just you just close your eyes and you can basically dial in a sound because there's everything you need is there yeah and it's it's simple enough it's Yeah, it's fantastic. I only use the presets when I've saved them for a show. Like when I did the Mary Cassio um, Journey to Cassiopeia record with the the brass band, Mm -hmm. um, she came on tour with me and, um, and yeah, I had her preset. But I had this problem with her that, you know, I didn't kind of think about it, but some of the components in it, it was really, really cold winter and Mm. I had her in a room it was like a kind of warehouse room that we were getting ready to play in and it was just so cold that it just wouldn't work and I was like oh "Oh my god what am I gonna do how am I gonna recreate the Juno 60 for this show and we just put the stage lights on and put them directly onto the top of the 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 memory board (laughs) And it warmed her up and she worked for the whole thing. That's amazing. <laughs> she was just a bit cold. <laughs> so. Oh, bless. She's really like a living thing. Yeah. That's what I love about it because you turn it on and there's this sound that comes out that's very quiet, but it's almost like it's singing. Um, I don't know if yours oh, has God. that, but it, it's just like this kind of whirling wave of just like a loop of just this sound of her, the background um like the sort of the chorus or something just yeah just swirling whirling away there on its own <laughs> do you love it when those there's some of those synths when you turn them off and they make a little like whip kind of sounds <laughs> those ones that kind of yeah, freak alive. out just yeah it's just like whoop. Yeah. um do you have any like software tools that you i mean we mentioned contact but it's always i'm not really speak to a lot of people about software and that's that's a huge part of making music yeah, no, I I tend to not. I mean, I use Logic and I use plugins, plenty of them, but I, that's kind of the, the only software that mm. I use in that sense. And I use a lot of sample libraries and and then manipulate those sounds. And I guess that kind of fits with my music in, in that sense that there is an organic element always present, whether it be a dulcimer that's been put through uh, reversed and and octaved and distorted, or, or or an organ sound that you know I've I've got off kind of d- various sites. Um, mm. But yeah, I really like uh, the guy that makes all the amazing real Heinbach. Is he called? Yeah, Heinbach. Oh yeah, yeah. I love his stuff. I think it's Heinbach. brilliant. That's yeah. prescient. We've we've got Heinbach on. He's he's been recorded for the show. Ah, <gasps> oh, yes. There's, there's so many like in insider references now on this, this program. <laughs> I know. But yes, his stuff is gorgeous. Like the landscapes he creates, it's beautiful. And you know all the kind of plugins that he makes is just amazing. I have not tried them. I have not tried the. I've got. The, have you tried the Gauss Looper? The new sort of, um, which is for your. It's um phone app and it's like a sort of based on tape loopers um but you know so you can you basically it's like you've got a kind of cassette machine in your iphone Ooh. with looping it's really good how um, do you spell that so gauss is g-a-u-s-s oh. um, gauss looper um and um yeah basically i forget the sort of well, fundamentally, you can use it as a looper and it has texture and you can do sort of sound on sound and you can also do kind of decaying loops. So you can, oh. you know, that kind of ripertronics and all yeah. that, that sort of good stuff. Um, and it's in your pocket. So if you're, you know, out in some hallway and there's a really nice kind of reverb, you can you know, mm. sing into it and loop it and all that. It's just oh, like, I love that. Oh, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll get that. That sounds really okay. interesting. Does it? Have you come across the artist Lomond Campbell? No. 
He's up in like the West Highlands, the West Coast sound, of Scotland. Sounds Scottish, yeah. And he um, created, I think King Creaso had commissioned him to make a kind of tape loop machine. And he's ended up making this kind of cassette looper thing that he's called loop as in L-U-P. Um, and it does a 12 second delay that then uh, that then disintegrates over time. And oh, yeah. it is gorgeous. And he's got a new record on Bandcamp that I think is beautiful. So you do get that kind of William Basinski, um, yeah. Steve Reich kind of yeah. movement. And he's just done it all on this homemade kind of tape machine. Um, I don't know if he does commissions. I hope he does because, like, I would I would really want one. <laughs> if he yeah, did. yeah. But it looks great. So, yeah, he's a good one to check out with that. But, yeah, if I, I'm going to get that on my phone, the Gauss. Definitely. That okay. seems like, but I do want, I know I'm looking at a picture of it. It looks sort of, yeah, otherworldly, like a little piece of science equipment with a tape in it. Mm -hmm. is, it is it a real machine that's been reworked into, so, or did he make it from scratch, do we know? I think he's made it from scratch, but couldn't that's be sure clever, on that detail. <laughs> There's that, what, have you ever done any digging on that, Steve Rice's sort of, like, um, machine that he made? There is this kind of, like... Um, you know, phased kind of synth gate module thing that he built. And there's some amazing photos of him using it. But, you know, obviously Steve Rice sort of famously is like, you know, like, doesn't like electronic music equipment. But yet he had this thing that he built. Um, and I don't know, are there recordings of it? I don't know if you're familiar with it or... No, I'm not. Uh, phase this... shifting pulse gate was oh, what it wow. was called. No, that sounds perfect for night tracks, but I have no idea. I did yeah. not know about that. Yeah, um, and it's, I I don't know what it is, other than, I mean, if it's a pulse gate, perhaps it's literally like, you know, you've got loops and you're just gating them, and if it's phase shifting, then it's that idea of slipping the time of multiples, so that, mm. um, I think, but I think it was, uh, my understanding of that machine, it was, it was sort of, uh, he kind of did it early, and then was like, no, nah, this is rubbish, let's just get human beings to do it, and that's when he led to the whole, you know, two people playing piano and slipping out. Yeah. Gosh, think of the different type of music he would be known for if he'd not. So regarding like solo work and collaborations, that was something I was wanting to to ask about. Obviously, this record was, you know, is a collaboration and, and sort of in many dimensions because it's collaboration with the people who make Electrosonic and then, uh, you know, with Timothy and stuff as well. But um, kind of what I was also getting at was the, the John Fox and Benj, the, you know, the Rhapsody <laughs> album. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just ask a bit about that, just because that seems like it's such a synthy process as well. Um, and I don't know if you could talk a bit about the experience of, of that and p particularly also that studio, like Benj's studio and what that's like and how do you, how do you go about writing music in a place like that? How do you... I How know. did it work? I know, where do you start? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say Ben has so many synths. I mean, maybe now he's like lives in the country, he has more time to mend them. But when I first went to that studio, there was synths piled high everywhere. Bits broken. There was even a workstation where his uh, friend could come and mend things. And he had all the, you know, the, the wires and the soldering iron and everything else. But... You know, the, the chances where you would pick up something and it would be half broken at the same time because he got it out of a skip or somebody had given it to him. And now they're priceless. But at the time when he was collecting things, you know, that people were chucking things out. The universities were just chucking their old equipment out. And so he kept them. And so you entered this kind of down, you left the street of Shoreditch and Hoxton and you went down the stairs to be met with this complete wall-to-wall -wall cave of everything analogue. I mean, it just felt like you were stepping back in time 30, 40 years. It was amazing. And, you know, to go there and experience that firsthand and then have Ben say, yeah, just take, just use what you need. Uh, let me know. <laughs> um, and, you know, discovering... I guess like things like clap traps yeah. and and monopolies and just like and experiencing everything f firsthand. I guess I'd only had a very limited experience because you know it's so expensive. Um, 
he even he even had a Peter Zinovni, uh oh what do you call them synthes yeah Peter Zinoviev's yeah like, yeah and um, uh, yeah just everything it was just, it's just a minefield anyway uh, so when I was making my very first kind of debut record with a producer called Mike Lindsay he was next door to Benj and him and John were making the first maths record and John used to come through the back of our studio to get to the kitchen or the toilet and you know very well dressed gentlemanly very striking and used to always very politely say hello and uh, such a lovely man and when they were then taking that record live because we'd met so many times in the studio and he'd seen that I played the violin and I was a keyboardist um he said you know do you want to do you want to be in the band and so I joined and it was basically a baptism of fire. It was uh, basically we kind of got the whole record and rehearsed in the studio. But Benj kind of had because he had so many synths, we were just trying out different synths to see which one could play or series of synths could play over the whole course of the record and John's back catalogue as well. Um, and so we were just trying out things. I was learning very fast how to recreate a sound on a record and what quickly to go to it was a massive learning experience and, yeah. and brilliant at the same time and john was like yep i want you to play violin I want as many pedals and sound you know as noisy basically we called it violence rather than violin because it was just it had to be <laughs> soaring and heavy and dirty and um and play manage that while singing and playing the synthesizers at the same time and changing all the settings for each song. <laughs> so. no, no biggie then, no pressure. <laughs> and then, you know, you've got Benj on the drums, the electronic drum kit, and then at the time, Serafina Steer was on electric bass through a chorus pedal and uh, a kind of a string synthesizer. So, yeah, it was it was an amazing time. And then when you know, when you're touring, you're learning so fast how to set things set up things, how to manipulate things and how to perform with all those kind of octopus hands as well. Yeah. Um so that you know, that experience set the tone for everything since really. And my love of collecting things and, and sounds and and performing in that way as well. What's his approach to collecting? Does he? How does he decide what to have in there? Does he just try to have everything? Has he got rules about what's in that that room? No, I think he just wants everything. Yeah, <laughs> I <enough. think> he <laughs> just wants, I and I think he's pretty close to at least getting <laughs> from, for, for definitely for every every year. I would say since since the sixties. I would say. I mean, maybe not the new stuff, but I think his walls, his modular walls, have become much much bigger since since he Great. was in London because he's got the room and I remember when seeing the designs for the new studio and it you know it honestly looks like you're walking in kind of a star a starship enterprise the way it's all laid out and his design ethic you know he studied fine art and was in the same year as Damien Hirst and so he has got that art brain and you know everything in terms of his artwork is made by him as well and he's the kindest kindest soul ever so oh. Very, yeah, it's good to know. <laughs> what did you? What was your sort of synth picks when you? How did? What was the synth that you played with? From or what did you choose from the mega archive? Oh my god, uh, Yamaha CS twenty. Yeah. Um. God, uh, eight oh eight. Yeah. Um. These are the ones that I went to regularly and like a little mouse used to take when he wasn't in and then put them in my studio and play and then put them back. <laughs> uh, the Monopoly, Cog Monopoly. Yeah. Oh, the Roland SH, uh, was it 101? Yeah, the grey SH one. Yeah. Well, it might have been blue or red. No, it was grey. Yeah. Things like, things like that. He had, um, what's the huge Yamaha synth called? With the, the CS80? Yes. Oh he had a goodness. massive CS80 with the, oh, the wow. kind of slide strip, and um, that's the one, isn't it? Oh, the, I mean, you can't mega. shift you can't shift that rooms really, but but that was on my very first record. I mean, it was kind of dubbed a kind of folk record, and I was a bit upset about that. But I can see now, looking back after ten years, why it would be put in that genre. But it had CS80 all over it, and I was like, that justifies it not being a folk record. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> What um, is, can you talk a bit about that instrument specifically? What was your what was your feeling about it? 
God, it is just handling a beast, isn't it? It's not, there's nothing, I think they're just the, I don't know, why is that slide strip not used on anything else? Like, it's just genius. Do, do you mean the ribbon? Yeah. Yeah. There are starting to be ribbons since again. Like in the last couple of years, there's, um, I can think of two Ooh. that have ribbons. But you're right. It's not, um, it fell out of favour. And it's, it's like um, the most amazing sound. Like I've always tried to recreate it with like my Jupiter 4 and doing long glissandos and, and, and you know, I just, I just, yeah, pitch bending, but it's not the same. Oh, I'm going to look out for some more ribbon stuff then. What about the sort of tone of it? And it's always the, this kind of legend of the CS80, isn't it, about the tuning and the fact that it's never really in tune. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess with everything and what I learned very fast with Benja's collection is the nuances of every every breathing synthesizer in that place. And the, the CS80 was definitely one of those that felt like a, it felt like you were playing the organ that had a life of its own. Yeah. It's the closest to playing an organ, I think. Like a like a church organ. Yeah. Have you played a church organ? Yeah, I did uh, quite a few times, and my grandfather was an organist in a cathedral oh, wow. over in Northern Ireland. So, yeah, I grew up with that sound. <laughs> what, what is that like? What is it like to play a church organ? Well, I mean, yeah, obviously depending on the size of it, but yes. I mean, it is powerful. I recently, well, I say recently because it's we've had a year of non-existence. But um, I, there's an organ, the Mulholland organ in the Ulster Hall in Belfast is incredible. And we were there doing a little bit of filming, and I got to play on the organ. And the sound that vibrates in the air and in the room, that it's just not replaceable. I mean, it. The only thing I can liken it with was when we did the Mary Cassio record with the brass band, it yeah. felt like that, like in terms of you feel the air moving. And obviously that takes 30 people to play, but then the organ in itself is just this beautiful breathing thing. I mean, it's, I mean, you, you can see why people, I guess, in some senses turned to religion and went to church because they could feel the air moving. I mean, it's like mm. spiritual kind of, awakening in some senses of hearing that loud sound and it's ornate and it looks like um so reverential i guess but vastly yeah it's it's far bigger than you i heard also i mean depending on the organ that um you know organs there are a few things obviously that can do this but organs can produce infrasound so mm. there's sort of sub sub 20 hertz sounds which are more attributed with experiencing feelings than Hmm. Um, than than sort of directly perceiving tones, and there's but potentially there's a sort of case to be made that part of the sort of literal fear of God and the reverence comes from the fact that you are you are subconsciously experiencing tones on your body that you can't you can't even hear. Yeah, I would say I I totally believe that. I totally believe that because I had, you get that, you get that feeling as if like kind of tingles down your spine. And I got that with the brass band when we did it. And those similar feelings, when I looked it up, there's the there's string theory, isn't it? That it, some people accustom this, the kind of movement of the, the particles in the air at a certain frequency um, as string theory, but as the voice of God and... Not, I don't believe that, but I do feel that you d you definitely touch something that moves you because there was moments with the brass band in particular that as soon as they played a certain sequence and a swell and that the, the air moved, it, it hit your gut, like it made you cry. Like there's no, there's this feeling of like complete expansive sound but also making you feel so tiny and inanimate, like that you you don't exist as well. It's it's like overwhelming, and I guess yeah. I I mean I can see why people call string theory in that fashion. <laughs> um, yeah, but you I mean you you must have talked quite covered quite a lot of organ with Sarah Debachi. Absolutely, and that was something that she spoke to. It was it's that idea of. Um... 
you can't divorce an organ from the room that it's in, you know, mm. and it's in a sense that the whole, or like the church is the instrument um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and the congregation also part of it too, because, you know, the presence of an audience changes the, the sort of response of sound. It changes the sort of reflections. And um, so it's this sense that it is like, you know, the church is one big lung that is sort of vibrating. Yeah. It's kind of it's wild. And it's, it's sort of the, um, it's that thing, you know, synthesizers in all our power and majesty. I've had this where I've made like demo videos of synthesizers and the direct sound doesn't sound as good as the kind of the very, uh, as basically the camera sound because the camera's hearing the room and there's this sort of, mm. um, there's when you actually hear that very short report of sound, um, it, it changes things. It makes things sound fuller and meatier yeah. and um and it's something i've tried to do in productions like especially with drums like drum machines like the 808 for example i did i was playing with um my one and it's um basically putting like really 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 short room rooms on 808 drums so mm -hmm. that you can't hear that there's room on it but it, it just makes it sound huger and fuller you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah like reamping yeah totally exactly yeah mm. I don't know if anyone, you've ever been to Real World Studios. No, alas. Yeah, I, I'm going there in a couple of weeks and I can't wait, but <laughs> they have the most amazing wood room that is perfect for reamping because you get that gorgeous warmth as well as the um, the sound. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that with the synths down there. <laughs> is it true that in, isn't it in Real World where there's like almost every room's got like tie lines or whatever you can sort of... Is that, or maybe I'm confusing that with other sort of stories, but it's the that notion that you can record in basically every room. God, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> like it's it's a, just a haven of sound, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. gorgeous. I mean, what, who who would think of to build a studio in the middle of a lake? <laughs> I think, yeah. like, well, why not? Just, I know exactly. It's just like yeah. Somehow I imagine like Benj in there, if it was kind of more like Dr. No's lair, it's that sort of, he seems to have that aesthetic with his, uh, yeah. his, his studios have that kind of lair like, you know, oh, he definitely, Bond villain. I mean, vibe. you should see his house. It's like something out of Thunderbirds. Yeah, I think <laughs> so. I have. And that's what's partly, I've seen some stills of it on like, I see why you left London. Like to leave it for that is it is like yeah, Tracy Island stuff. Yeah. Uh, and his doesn't his desk have like a phone on it? Yeah, like it's got. It's got. I these love that. Three love orange that. phones. I think it was. For, it must have been. It was a mixing desk from a BBC studio or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm so glad we're talking about Benj because he's one of those people that people should know about and don't know about, like in. Yeah, only very few people in the electronic world know about Benj. He's like a secret, hidden identity. Is that where I, like I came across him because of that album? The is it? I forget the number of systems, but twenty. Twenty. Yeah, twenty. Twenty yeah. systems, um, which was an album for those who are listening. Which is an album that is every track is made with one synthesizer. You know, mm -hmm. and I think I'm not sure if the. I think some of them, yeah, they're definitely multi-tracked some, but I think some are just complete performances yeah. through. And mm -hmm. the, I remember the one that really I loved was the Memory Moog one. Um, oh, yeah. Which, which is just gorgeous. And was actually, it was recently I read on Six Music, I was like, this is Benj. And someone's done like a sort of cover, basically, where they've sampled yeah, that tune. Yeah, I know who that is. That's Mr. Erlen Cooper. Yeah, so Erlen would have worked with Benj in Shoreditch and worked with me as well so yeah. very close world but yeah yeah it's nice that his his work has been taken into different angles as well exactly i was like yeah that's um but it is i do find that interesting that sort of the discipline aspect and it's like a nice way of exploring a synth because it does when i'm sort of my other kind of like nerd uh fanboy is for aphex twin mm. and like there are a lot when you sort of unpick the clues in codes. He's another example of how to sort of manage an absurd, obese synthesizer collection because the key takeaway I've had is he doesn't seem to use it all at once. Like he's not using a bit of everything on one track. He's he's making a small cluster of instruments that's like his own mini little studio 
Um, mm. Just as Benji's like saying, I'm just going to use, yeah, sure, I've got 5,000 synthesizers, but today I'm just using one. And it's, I feel there's a lesson there in, in, in a healthy way to manage synthesizer addictions. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. that's how you do it. Yeah, it's all, yeah, I mean, it's feeding the love, isn't it? Just by giving that one a time and effort to that one synth. It's like, it's precious almost, isn't it? Rather than kind of showing off. I, I think, I mean, I think that, as we said before, limitations are key to making good music sometimes because you just want to, there's so many things to explore and it can explode your, your mind otherwise. Yeah, and I remember when Ben first got his first buckler and, it, you know, obviously all the coloured wires everywhere and he then he got a music box one and I remember saying to him, can I borrow it? And it was just so expensive at the time. He was like, no, I'm still learning oh, it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I, you know, I remember looking it up and going, no, there's no way I'm spending that money, but it's crazy. So um, I suppose the final question, what is the future of music technology? What for you is the... AI, definitely, without any doubt. What aspect? What, to do what? The ability to teach an AI machine your techniques and take them further or apply certain things. Um, you know, I guess inputting data. I mean, AI is inputting data. As we know, it is a way to, you know, if you're inputting certain things and techniques that you're using or certain chords or, you know, then that AI baby is like Holly Herndon has mm. has created, has spawned, um, you know, she's creating music with a synth, which is singing, uh, uh, an AI, sorry, that is singing her vocals, how she would do them and collaborating with herself. And I think that's, I think in, in the future we'll have maybe our doors and our, uh, plugins will maybe have AI attached to them so they learn how we are using things and how we want to use them better. And I guess there's a lot of technology around kind of um, mid-air haptics, you know, where you don't have to necessarily touch stuff. You can control things with your body or your hands. And, mm. I mean, you know, Image and Heap's obviously done their kind of yeah. Mew Mew gloves and things, but I think there's even a further stage of that. I mean, we're, we're using technology to talk over zoom and things like that so so i guess the next stage of that is to be able to change things that are in the air using our cameras and connecting that with the music and that's how i would like to see it going i think that would be very exciting are you happy to relinquish control to an ai you know how do you know it's i don't know that it's got your a it's got your best interests at heart but you know can you speak to that idea that you're you're giving up, you know, decisions and, and Yeah. Because I think that ultimately you're not I think if you were to make an AI piece of music, if if you Googled, I think it's AI, it's on YouTube, it's like continuous uh metal music made by AI. Like night and day, it is going and going and going. It's had data inputted into the best kind of metallic music and and rock music and then these riffs are played there is a certain element that it isn't very good <laughs> and i think that without the human intervention ai will never be that great i think you know i don't, I don't it doesn't have the emotion maybe it will maybe it will get to that stage but i have no fear about that i think you know i think you know if we'd have said 50 years ago Oh, we use all these digital plugins. People might have been horrified, <laughs> mm. and it, I guess it's in the same respect with AI. I think there's a potential there to make bigger and better things, robotics, um, and and work with nature, and and in a way that we can't as humans. I think with that amount of data, yeah. <laughs> nice but thank you very much <laughs> yeah. you're welcome <laughs> Hannah Peel is ace thanks Hannah that was wicked I loved talking to you about synthesizers. I sort of walked away from that conversation kind of 
energized. I was really like jazzed up. I came sort of storming into the house and like, like walking around like a weirdo because it's just, just really nice to talk to people. I'm in this cave by myself. Uh, it is true. Like, oh my goodness. Like the value of a really good chat is just, it's so nice. And I think it's, uh, it's something I've been reading about recently because I got this book, Digital Minimalism, which is about sort of stepping away from text-based media. What it talks about is the fact that as human beings, we're evolved with our big old brains to absolutely crave the detailed nuance of human communication, staring into another person's face and listening to the cadence and the tone of their voice and deducting their intent is absolutely what our brains are wired to do because if you're good at that, then you're good at surviving and anticipating, you know, is someone about to stab me or hit me over the head with a rock? Uh, and so that kind of rich human, human communication of which we've been so sorely stripped of over the last year or more has just, uh, yeah, it's kind of brought to a head how important that is. And so I'm very lucky to have these conversations with amazing people. Um, and I feel <laughs> better for having them, quite honestly. And I very much hope that you feel better for listening to them. I hope it feels like you're kind of sat with us. Uh, even though uh, she was in um, you know, Northern Ireland and I was in Yorkshire while we had that conversation. Felt like I was chatting to a person right next to me. It was wonderful. Yes, what a great person. What a good chat. All the stuff to sort of dissect there. But I think there's that moment where she was talking about colliery brass band swells with this sort of the show that she did is Mary Cassio making her tear up, making you feel like you don't exist in that moment. I thought that was a real moment of sort of transcendence, thinking about how you can truly get lost in music, literally and, well, figuratively, emotionally lost. That really sort of, I was like, oh my God, I want, I want to experience that. I want to experience getting lost in a brass band. God, I miss shows and festivals and if live events um because actually that you know the mary cassio thing she was talking about in fact you can watch that whole show uh it was at blue dot festival and it's mary cassio's journey to cassiopeia there is the whole set is on the blue dot youtube channel and it's beautiful sort of haunting music there's her with a um mofo i was about to say sequential but it was dave smith mofo um, and she's got a the Juno 60 that we talked about, her, her Juno 60. It is a Lady Juno 60. And actually, I then realised that that was in 2017. And I was at that blue dot in 2017 because I was playing a set with the early years on the Sunday night and I missed Mary Cassio's show. I don't know if I knew about it. I don't know if I knew why I should have gone, but I should have gone. But thank goodness that we can see it on YouTube. And actually, um, funnily enough, when I mentioned to Hannah, you know, I was like, oh, I went to this talk with the Radiophonic Workshop and they were talking about Blue Veils and Golden Sands. That was actually at that Blue Dot Festival that Hannah was at as well. So, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, isn't it funny? Small world, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Hannah Peel. Thank you for your time. And give my love and squits to Bertie Moog. And so while we can't go to a festival just right this very second and sit in a field and enjoy gorgeous organic music, what you can do is purchase the album Fur Wave by Hannah Peel and just put it on and sit in a field. And actually, that would be a really, really, really lovely experience. It is like a record that you can kind of inhabit. It's lovely. And think of trees. So purchase Fur Wave. I will put links to it below. And thank you. Now, we have had a letter to the show, and I would like to share it with you in this moment before we head on for the day. Now, the letter comes from a Mr. Bruce Crawford, who wrote in following the recent episode with Tom Whitwell, where me and Tom talk about watching Kraftwerk in 1981. Well, let me be very clear. I wasn't invented in 1981, so I wasn't watching Kraftwerk, but people were. I was talking about watching recordings of the Kraftwerk gig and, of course, Jeremy Della talking about it in his documentary, Everybody in the Place. And the letter is from Bruce Crawford, and Bruce was at one of the Kraftwerk gigs in 1981. 
And I think it would be nice to just read that out because it was interesting to, to hear his take. Bruce writes thus. Hiya. Just listened to your latest chat with Tom Whitwell while driving home and you made my spine tingle with the bit about Kraftwerk in 1981. The reason being, I was there. Myself and my mates were at the gig at Rock City, Nottingham, which I noticed on just checking the records was for some reason postponed from May until June. Perhaps Kling Clang proved heavier than expected. I just wanted to say your description is pretty spot on. To this day, I would pick it as the greatest living gig I ever went to, and I saw Joy Division play live. I would have been 21 at the time. I am 61 now. They did the whole bit with Ralph holding the calculator into the audience for people to play notes on while the band danced at the front of the stage like anything but robots. It wasn't just Computer World. They did other stuff, including, if I recall correctly, a proper 20-minute version of Autobahn, not like the cut-down version they do these days. What you said in the podcast really resonated with me, so I just wanted to say thanks. Oh, that's nice. Thanks, Bruce. Yes, what I was saying was it would have been incendiary to be influential, you know, in a in a period of influence in your life and see that. And I think it's true. There's a reason why lots of people in their 50s and 60s are buying, you know, affordable clones of synthesizers because they're trying to relive these days, you know, when you were in your 20s and you were seeing these bands with this amazing equipment and thinking, God, I wish I could have that but could never afford one. Well, you can now because you can basically have any synthesizer for almost next to nothing, it seems. What a time we live in. Thanks, Bruce. So I want to thank our sponsors. That is signalsounds.com if you need to buy musical equipment and Skillshare. If you would like to learn some new skills, click the link and get yourself some free learning. Finally, if you are enjoying these bleeps and you have enjoyed previous and you would like to enjoy future bleeps, please head your mouse click also to patreon.com forward slash mylar melodies in order to consider chipping in to the Patreon fund and therefore helping fund future worry bleeps and YouTube videos about synthesizers that I am producing. Patreon.com forward slash mylar melodies please consider chipping in. It's absolutely the way to support this and help it keep going. And on the next Why We Bleep, funny that Hannah should mention it, we have Mr. Heinbach. It will be very good to have him back. So thank you for your attention. Stay tuned. And we'll see you next time. Bye.